Hey, it's Michael Thiessen here, and today I'm going to be talking to you about five patterns for better components. So we're going to cover a few different patterns here. We're going to cover uh, ranging from state management to how to break up components in better ways to split them up and simplify them. And we're also going to talk about passing data between components. So not just managing state, whether it lives inside or outside of components, but how to pass data between them. So first up, we've got the data store pattern. And this comes up because we have three main problems when we're dealing with state moving around in our application between components. So we've got prop drilling, we have event frothing, and we also have cousin components. So prop drilling is when we've got a prop and we're passing it through layer after layer after layer of component. And we only use it at the very bottom level. So the middle layers are not really doing anything useful other than just like passing it along. And so we don't want to do this because it makes our app brittle. If we need to refactor it, we might not remember that we've got these intermediate layers and it just makes things a lot more complex because we're just passing it through so many components. On the flip side, we also have event frothing. So event frothing is because we're bubbling up these events from a lower layer up through several different layers of components. And it's very similar to prop drilling, just the opposite direction. So we also have this idea of cousin components or when we need to get state from one component all the way across to another component. And if there's not a, a simple parent-child relationship there, it can be hard to, to do that without resorting to prop drilling and event frothing. And we want to avoid those if possible. So that leads us to the data store pattern. And this pattern lets us directly inject that state that we need right to the components that need it without having to pass things around all over the place. This also works the opposite way for events and updating our state. So we implement this pattern using a composable that lets us create shareable state. So the first part is we're gonna need a global state singleton. Then we're going to take some of that state and share it amongst all these different components. And we might keep some of that state as private. And lastly, we may add on some business logic methods that are going to work on that state in our composable. So to implement the global state singleton, we are just going to create a state object with the reactive method. And you'll notice that we have this state created outside of the composable. We don't have it inside of the composable because that means that every component where we call this composable would actually create a new state. And we don't want that. We want the same state to be used over and over again. And once we've got that in place, we can then move on to exposing certain parts of the state. In this example, we are taking the dark mode and sidebar collapsed pieces, and we are going to return them from our composable. But in order to do that properly, we're going to call two refs on our state object. And this takes our reactive object and returns a bunch of individual refs that lets us pass around these values individually. So in this example here, all that we need is the dark mode value. And we're able to just like pluck off that single variable and work with it instead of having to pass around this entire giant state object. Well, it's not giant in this example, but it could become much larger in a real application. And lastly, we're going to need some, some methods to modify our state. So 
here we add in the change theme method, which lets us control how the theme variable is updated in our state because there are only so many themes to choose from. But then to make sure that the components can't update this variable on their own, we're going to call, call the read only method. And this will return us uh, a ref that can only, or a read only ref that can't be updated. So we in this composable are the only ones that can update this ref. The next pattern that we want to work on and, and that I want to teach to you today is the hidden components pattern. And this one is a bit more complex, but it's really powerful once you start to understand it. And so what we're going to work with here is subsets of features within your component. So there are components lurking somewhere inside of these bigger components that you've got. And our goal is to try and tease them out to figure out where we can pull them apart and create simpler components out of a much larger component. So if we take this example here, we've got two subsets of functionality where each branch of this VIF is a separate subset. And we have the, the true path and we have the false path. But these are completely distinct. We can't take both paths of this branch at once. So either we are rendering the first part or we're rendering the second part. So there's nothing stopping us from just splitting this up into two separate components because these are independent pieces of functionality and they don't really need to be living within the same component. They don't need to be living in the same file. And so that's the general idea of this whole pattern, the hidden components pattern, is that we can tease apart these different subsets of functionality. But we were looking at the code here in order to determine those subsets. But I find that the easiest way to, to find these subsets is actually to look at how the component is being used elsewhere in our application. So if we slightly modify that example, and we instead have two conditionals. Now it's not true that we can use that these are distinct. We could have both of these being rendered at the same time. Um, and so instead, what we'll need to do is look at how this component is being used elsewhere in the application for hints as to what these subsets of functionality might be. So we look in our code base and we see, oh, these conditionals are never used together. We're either using the first conditional or we're using the second conditional set to true. They are never true at the same time, although there's nothing preventing that, but it's just not how this component is really used. So that tells us that we can split this out into these two distinct components. The first component here and then the second component where each one sets that internal conditional to true. Now there's a lot more to get into with this hidden components pattern, but unfortunately I wanna to get to the three other patterns we've got to today. So I can only cover it so far. The next one being the preserve object pattern. So I've had this question asked to me several times, and I've also wondered it myself, and that is, is it better to pass the entire object to a component or pass the individual props to the component? And the answer here is that we actually should be passing the entire object most of the time. And the reason for that is that typically components that need part of an object are going to need more of that object over time because typically we add more features, code gets longer, components get bigger. It's not usually the case that we remove features or remove code in that way. So things tend to grow over time. 
The second one is that in my opinion, it's easier to, to use with TypeScript. We can, if we have a user type, for example, we can just type it using that user type. If we were instead to pass individual properties to this component, we'd have to pick off the individual properties of that user type in order to, to give a nice uh, prop definition. But that gets a little more complicated and it's just simpler to pass in the whole thing. So taking these two together, I think it's generally better to pass both or to pass a whole object at once. But there's another aspect of this that we should look into. And it's that it's when we have several different components that are using part of an object. So while not exactly part of the preserve object pattern, this is sort of tangentially related in that if we find this, this is a pretty good hint that really we should be combining this all into the same component. Because if we're accessing data off the same object over and over and over again, there's likely duplicated functionality and duplicated code within these different functions, within these different components. And by combining them all into this user card instead, we actually can simplify that and make our code base easier to understand. We have another little thing that, that we should keep in mind, and it's the hidden state. And this, this is very similar to the hidden components pattern, which we saw earlier. And it's when we have a user type, for example, if we notice that we've got these different properties, name, age, street, city, state, but if we notice that street, city, and state are constantly being used all the time, but together, then that tells us that there's this distinct subset of the state, similar to how we were looking at distinct subsets of functionality with the hidden components pattern. Here, we're looking at distinct subsets of our type. And so, that gives us a clue that we could potentially tease this apart into two separate, separate types and instead have an address type and a user type. So the next pattern I want to talk to you about today is the extract conditional pattern. And this one I really like because it is so easy to apply and can be pretty much applied wherever you see a VF. And so the basic idea here is that we're going to take every branch of the VF and we're going to extract it out into its own component. Now, the reason that we can do this and we know that each of these branches makes sense as their own component, and we don't really need to give it much further thought is because of how how VFs and conditionals work. We know that each branch is going to do one particular thing. If it's true, we're going to do this thing. If it's false, we're going to go in a different direction and do this other thing. Sorry, we're going to do this other thing. So each branch is semantically related. So that means when we extract the branch out into their own component, each component is going to be focused on a specific thing, which is exactly what we want to do. The second thing is that not only are these branches within each other, which were within themselves cohesive in what they're doing, but each branch does a separate thing. So instead of having them as a single component, it makes sense to have them split out into separate components because if we're going true, we're going to do one thing, but if, if it's false, we're going to do a separate thing. If they were doing the same things, then we could put them into the same component and it would make more sense that way. But if you put a, if you put a VF there, it's probably not the same thing, whether true or false. 
So I want to give you a quick example of this. On my blog, I've got this component that lists out a collapsed state and an expanded state of our of this uh, list of articles. So if we look at the code for this component, there are the two branches, the collapsed and then the expanded at the bottom. If we extract these these two branches out into their own components, we simplify this code a lot because we can look at it at a glance and know, okay, the top part is the collapsed article and the bottom one is the expanded article. We don't have to worry about reading through the code line by line to try and understand what's going on. And so this last pattern that I wanna share with you today is the list component pattern. And so we're going to expand on this example that we're just working with and simplify it even further. So we've got these two components, article collapse and article expanded, but we don't really care about the V4, the key attributes. They don't really do anything for us. They're really just implementation details of this loop of this v4. So what we can do is to simply push that into the component itself and now we've got these list components which again further simplifies this component. And the reason that we like to do this is similar to in JavaScript with us using for each or filter or map methods because most of the time we don't really care about all the details of the loop we just kind of want to do something with a list of items and so this is the same same approach here if you really need to you can use a v4 and have full control over what's going on but most of the time you just need to render out a list of a particular item so those are all the patterns that I wanted to share with you today. And now is the part where I get to share with you what I've been up to. And for those of you who don't know, I am a full-time view educator. So I do this kind of thing as my job. I'm lucky enough to do that. And I, I am very grateful for, for that. And so that means that I, I write articles and I have a newsletter and I do talks like this for my job. But I also have a bunch of different courses and products that you can get if you want to learn more about Vue. And so the one that I've uh, released uh, most recently is the Clean Components Toolkit. So all of the patterns that I've shared today are from the Clean Components Toolkit. And it's a collection of 18 different patterns. It's a collection of 18 different patterns, tools, techniques on using Vue better. So we've got a whole bunch of different things in here. You can see we've got the preserve whole object, which we covered in this talk. But what, what I do with this toolkit is that each tool, you get the overview where I talk about what it does, how to use it, how to think about it. But then each one, you'll get a full refactoring example of a real life app where you'll see how to apply this in a, like a real life setting. And you'll get step-by-step -step refactorings where you can understand these patterns at a much more fundamental and deeper way. So there's the refactoring steps. Then there are quizzes so you can test your knowledge on the info, as well as a video where I go over the quiz answers and sort of dive deeper into my own uh, reasoning as to why the, the answers are the way they are. So that's Clean Components Toolkit. I also want to, 
I also want to share with you about mastering Nuxt 3. If you are at all interested in Nuxt, this is the best way to learn Nuxt. It's the official course in partnership with View School and Nuxt Labs. And we cover building Nuxt, a Nuxt app from the front end all the way down the stack to the database. And you will learn everything you need to know about building full stack apps in Nuxt. And lastly, I just released a, the second edition of my book, View Tips Collection. It's got 118 different tips on using Vue, and these are bite-sized tips that you can use. It's a beautiful hardcover book, and um, well, I might as well just show you. This is the book. If you want it, you can get it, and it's really awesome, and I think you'll enjoy it. So I hope you enjoyed my talk, and I hope you enjoy the ones to come. All right, Michael, we have some questions for you, but before that, your book is really pretty. Thank it you. is a beautiful book. <laughs> Do you want to call that out first? Uh, yeah, all thanks. right, we have quite a few questions. As always, uh, you're a great teacher, so all the questions always come. First off, how do you approach the trade-off between component size and efficiency when choosing platforms? Oh wow! Starting off with the with the easy ones. Um, <laughs> so I think this question is like maybe one of the hardest to to answer in terms of like patterns because it's very much uh, along the lines of it depends, which is my least favorite answer to give. <laughs> um, but component size and efficiency. Um, so if we're talking about like performance efficiency, um, this isn't something I haven't looked into specifically, but I'm not sure that component size really makes a difference in terms of, um, like your web performance and, and all of that, unless, um, like if, maybe in like very specific circumstances, but in general, I don't know that it would um in terms of like developer efficiency there is a point where you know if you have um if you have a million little tiny components then that's more frustrating than having a single giant component because you've got to you know jump around between every file and so it's it's maybe more about like you'll know it when you when you see it kind of um it's a very wishy-washy answer but i don't know like i i feel like my own personal um preference for when it's small too small sort of changes as i as i've learned different things but yeah hopefully it, that was it helpful is one of those <laughs> yeah it is one of those that it depends but i i like the the thought process that you put into it thank you all right uh Beyond the big five, are there any hidden gems or niche patterns that you found particularly useful? Um, I mean, there are a lot of patterns. Um, and I would say, yes, there are. There are lots of patterns that I found useful. And I guess this is kind of like what I do is is trying to like find the best patterns and, and teach them and share them. Um, one that's top of mind right now is the uh, the controlled props pattern. Um, I because I just released an article on it, and uh, basically it's where if you have, for example, like a like a toggle button, or you, you want to toggle something on your page that's going to open or close. Normally, you would have state inside of that toggle button that tracks whether it's open or closed, um, and for most of the time that works great until you want to some of the time override that internal state and so maybe you want a different button or something else 
elsewhere in your app to override that toggled state and like force that thing to be open. And so this this pattern lets you do that in a nice way. It's hard to explain without any code examples. <laughs> I, I think that, that that was a decent one without code examples. Um, and I think this goes into that question, but also our first question, but like when it is the best, when it is it the best to choose one pattern over another and how do you know when to use which pattern? Yeah, so this, this um, it depends on the pattern and like what problem you're trying to solve. So um, here I, in this, in this talk, I, I shared, um, so the data store pattern is about state management. And so obviously like you're not gonna be choosing between the data store pattern or hidden components because they solve different problems. Um, one solves state management and the other one is more of like a like how your components are are put together and those are separate things so that's like one easy way of, of thinking about it um the other way is um to use your best judgment i would i would say like once you understand the patterns uh then it you have to look at your own specific situation and what you're trying trying to do and try and figure out the best what pattern seems to make the most sense. Um, in my in my courses, I try to do it as best as possible, like some guidance on like, oh, you know when to use this one and like the con extract conditional one, I, I mentioned like you can almost always use it there are some cases where you you might not want to because you don't want to have like a hundred little tiny components. And so you're like, okay, we can have a component with a bunch of conditionals in there and it's all right. And so, yeah, the, the patterns don't replace your need to like think things through basically and use your own judgment. Cool, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of these uh, do lead into each other as well of like ensuring any patterns that we're using um, to that are still rev relevant and adaptable to as the view ecosystem changes. How do you how would you suggest somebody and make sure that they're staying up to date? Yeah, so when I think about patterns like this, I'm really trying to think about the things that that don't change. And um, so like the specifics of the the data store pattern, for example, we're we're using the the composition API in there. And so um, if the composition API changes, then the the principles and the ideas of the of the pattern are still good, but maybe we need to tweak some of the details. but um, like some of these other patterns that I share work and would have worked with uh, like view two when it first came out and will likely continue to work in into the future. And so I really try and think about like what, when we're coming up with these patterns or trying to like uh, distill them down, what can we learn that won't change so that we don't have to like, <laughs> keep updating our knowledge because that's so frustrating in this you know web world where everything changes all the time and so yeah that's something i really focus on it makes my job easier too thank you <laughs> all right uh is themes in themes dot includes uh brackets new theme brackets a global variable um i can't recall exactly what my my code example in that spot was um but themes should be referencing that uh that global state so i think yes oh themes yes now i remember okay so themes was just like um 
a list of themes that you've got provided in this imaginary application. So yes, it is like a global variable. Um, maybe you have your themes listed in a database somewhere or just like a JSON file that lists out the themes that you can use in your app. So that's kind of what I was going for in that example. Thank you. Uh, why use this custom store instead of Pina? This is a very good question. Um, and I uh, was going to address this in the talk, but um, didn't for lack of time. But uh, turns out I should have. <laughs> Uh, I saw a few of you asking about this. So um, there are a few things. So Pina uses the data store pattern. It just adds on a bunch of, um, I shouldn't say just, it It adds on a lot of extra awesome things like SSR support and DevTools integration. And, uh, you know, it helps to manage some of these things that we don't want to um, have to worry about. Uh, at the same time, uh, so it so Pinyu uses the data store pattern. So it's nice to sort of see from a different perspective how Pinyu is working. So that's that's one reason why I like this pattern. The second is that sometimes uh, you don't want to use Pinyu for whatever reason you may have, and um, yeah, that's that's basically that's basically it. I I have talked with Eduardo about this and how it relates to Pina, and um, he mentioned that there are some places where Pina does not make sense all the time. Um, although when when I was talking with him, he couldn't come up with like a specific example um, because that's hard to do on the spot. <laughs> yes. So so I don't have any good examples for you, but. Um, I hope that, that helps, helps though. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay. Last question. What is the difference or benefit of using this uh, pattern data store pattern and just using the local storage to store a global state? Yeah. So really these are uh, two separate things. So there's the pattern, which is how you're structuring the state and the code. And then there is local storage, which is where all that state gets put. So if you just um, each component directly accesses local storage, then like without using any other sort of pattern, then you have just like free global state. But it's global state that will continue to persist, you know, once you've closed the window and you come back. But with the data store pattern, you have a bit more control and structure around how you're you're sharing that global state and what you're doing with it. And so with, with that, you can actually have the data store pattern that uses local storage underneath if you if you want to have that persisted. Uh, similar to how in Pina you can have um, local storage to to keep things persisted around. Um, and if you use like view use has a composable that lets you do this, uh, in a nice way. And so you could drop that in there. And then, um, instead of your state in the data store, just dying when you close the page, it'll live and, uh, yeah, you can reuse it. Interesting. Thank you. Awesome. Well, that uh, concludes all of our questions for you, Michael. Thank you for joining us today.